on this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. We're changing the paradigm of what's possible because most people, you know, they just get old, they, they start falling apart the last 10, 15 years, and then they die. Let's not completely discount lifestyle or, or environment on what's happening to a person and solely base everything on genetics. We're able to challenge each other or do different experiences as opposed to living in some kind of echo chamber where we only do one thing. Health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and much more. My name is Ben Greenfield. Welcome to the show. Well, howdy doody ho. Uh, today I'm actually chatting with a couple of my so-called biohacker friends, uh, Matt Gallant and Wade Lightheart. Both of these guys have been on my show before. Both of them were incredibly popular and full of knowledge bombs they deliver in this episode as well, which is actually brought to you uh, by Bioptimizers, their company, which you'll learn a lot more about in today's show. Uh, today's show is also brought to you by my company, Keon my little playground for all things health and wellness. It's the company that I created to scratch my own itch to blend ancient wisdom with modern science. And one of the cool formulas we have over there is something I actually take before any meal that contains carbohydrates or alcohol. It's a blend of rock lotus extract, and then also uh, bitter melon extract. So it helps to regulate glucose metabolism and maintain insulin sensitivity, but then it also really helps the way that fats are handled by your liver and it activates several metabolic pathways that are important to anti-aging. So it's called Keon Lean and you just take two before carbohydrate containing meals. Today we talk a lot about what to take before fat containing meals, but Keon Lean would be the one to pop before you have carbs and it also works really well for alcohol, you get a 10% discount on this stuff. You just go to getkeon.com and use code BGF10. This podcast is also brought to you by the best blood boosting, blood building powder you're ever going to get your hands on. Normally, you'd have to pay out the wazoo like 12, 13 bucks for a full on juice that contains 11 different superfoods, but this stuff made by Organifi called Organifi Red gives you all those benefits for nitric oxide, for cardiovascular performance. It's even got adaptogens in it to support your immune system. Uh, it's got a ton of antioxidants in it, all from your favorite berries without you having to chop or clean up or shop or anything. You just put a few scoops and a nice cold glass of water or shake it up in a Nalgene bottle before a workout or a competition, and you will pretty much have the equivalent of of red Viagra circulating through your whole body uh, with none of the side effects. Well, perhaps you might get a few of the, the more pleasant side effects of said blue pill, but uh, this red juice powder, you get the idea. It's amazing. It basically just vasodilates your whole body and helps you to build blood. You get a 20% discount on this. If you go to Organifi.com, that's Organifi with an I, Organifi.com slash Ben, and use code BENG20 to get 20% off at Organifi.com slash Ben. Hey, folks. So my guests on today's show are coming back for a three-peat, which means they must be good or they must be controversial or at least mildly interesting. Uh, these cats first appeared in an episode with me about probiotic enemas, digestive enzymes, uh, breath work, low protein diets, and a whole bunch more, especially in the realm of nutrition. Uh, I'll, of course, link to that in the show notes for this episode, which I'll reveal to you shortly. But then they appeared again on an episode entitled, How I've Been Able to Gorge on Delicious Gluten-Filled Foods Without Feeling Like I Swallowed a Pair of Motor-Powered Scissors Tearing Up My Intestines. 
That episode was also pretty interesting, and in that one, as the name alludes to, we took a pretty deep dive into all things gluten and gliadin and how to control a lot of the damage generated by by gluten-filled foods. Uh, so these guys are a ton of fun to talk to. They're fellow biohackers, nutrition enthusiasts, fitness freaks, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they are Matt Gallant and Wade Lightheart. So Matt is a friend of mine. He's an entrepreneur. He's an ex-rock guitarist, poker champion, and a serial entrepreneur. He's built 13 companies in the last 20 years. Uh, he's also a strength conditioning coach. He has a degree in kinesiology, and he is the CEO and co-founder of a nutrition supplements company called Bioptimizers. And then Wade, his partner in crime, is the host of the Awesome Health Podcast. He's a three-time all-natural national bodybuilding champion. And uh, as I recollect from our previous discussions on other episodes, uh, is primarily doing that on a plant-based diet. Uh, he's also the advisor to the American Anti-Cancer Institute, or an advisor to the American Cancer Anti-Cancer Institute. And he's the co-founder of Bioptimizers. He's also got some books that he's written, like Staying Alive in a Toxic World and The Wealthy Backpacker. And I'll link to all of that in the show notes as well. So why I wanted to get these guys back on the show is because Matt pinged me a few months ago and told me they'd been taking a pretty deep dive into nutrigenomics, into ketosis, into amplifying the ability to be able to digest fats and fix a lot of common mistakes, uh, especially for people who are following like a low carb, uh, high fat or ketogenic diet. And so, you know, they've been deep in the Batman caves at Bioptimizers looking into a whole bunch of new things that I wanted to talk about on today's show. So before we jump in, uh, all the notes, everything we talk about, you can find at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash upgrade keto. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash upgrade keto, because we're going to be telling you about uh, how to how to upgrade keto and a whole lot more. So Wade, Matt, welcome to the show, fellas. Super excited to be here. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah. Word. And and as usual, I know you guys are always doing all sorts of weird things, so I figured just right off the bat, I'd get this out of the way and ask you what uh, what you've been up to today, whether it be a workout or some crazy biohack or nutrition tactic or whatever else that you think might be mildly interesting to folks that you've been engaged in prior to hopping on the show with me. Wade, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, <clears throat> this morning I just broke a three-day water fast. So um, <clears throat> I'm in a reduction program. So one of the things I like to do is just, just you know, build up to fasting and and uh, pushing kind of one of our products that we're just testing some of the parameters inside of it. So uh, yeah, I just broke that this morning for three days and did my and the thing was, is during the fast, I still maintain my regular workouts and kind of longer sessions on a rebounder. I jump on a rebounder every day um, to pump lymphatic fluid, particularly, I think it's really good for that without impact. And so I com combine those two things. Oh, hold on, I got to interrupt you, man. Like, Aren't you concerned about all the bodybuilders and athletes listening in right now snickering that you're talking about being able to work out in a fasted state, but your workout is on a rebounder? Well, that's one of them, but that was one. Re <laughs> that's my that's my workouts in the morning, but I do a weight training. So yesterday I was doing a, a full body uh, workout, which was I'm doing a combination of strength and density where I'm hitting my legs or each body part three times a week, one in a high rep, high time under tension routine, which is what I was doing yesterday, which is the whole body and then targeted uh, groups each and every day uh, in the other three sessions. And then stacking that on kind of long, slow, slow walks and intermittent with rebounding sessions in between. So that, that's kind of the, what I'm playing around with right now. <clears throat> to to see, kind of see how far I can accelerate weight loss without without compromising my metabolism. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, so Wade, when you say you're doing those workouts on a three day fast, is this like a dry fast, water fast? Are you incorporating any of these things that some people do on a fast, like exogenous ketones or aminos or anything like that? Yeah. So I do, uh, it's a pure water fast. And then the last day when you're kind of, cause usually I find that we don't see a metabolic shutdown for the first two days, you're still pretty good, but that third day kind of gets tough. And what I typically do is I'll cut water, go for a really long, about a, it's about a four hour walk that I do. And then I go right into the steam room in a kind of a dehydrated state to kind of force my body to convert fat into water. Water. And uh, the resonant weight loss usually on that three days is around 10 pounds hmm. and then which is a considerable amount of water rate. Now, when I do get out of when I do get out of the the, the sauna uh, and come home, I'm kind of fried. Like I'm in a pretty dehydrated state. So then I'll add some electrolytes and amino acids and things like that in my drink. So I'm kind of breaking the fast that last day just to just so I don't screw myself up yeah. <laughs> too, yeah. too badly from the dry fasting. But I, I really do practice pushing the limit and getting my body temperature up. And what's nice about that is I notice my body temperature stays warm, which if I extend a fast, oftentimes your body temperature starts down. And that's usually an indication that you're getting into metabolic slowdown. But I woke up this morning and I, I was still cooking. And, uh, and, and then now then just broke my fast after that because I want it to be you know, relatively sharp for our call today. Now, now is this because you're prepping for a show and you're you're uh, making weight, or why exactly are you doing something this extreme, like combining all that with a three day fast? You know, it's just kind of one of these fun, weird things I like to do. Most people wouldn't put that in the fun category, dude. Yeah, <laughs> you know, one of the things that you know, I, I think you know, my Nate, my background was a bodybuilder. That's where I got started in this whole thing, and I think bodybuilders in a lot of parts were the original biohackers. In other words, they just would test things and experiment and there wasn't a lot of research supporting it. They would kind of go experientially and see what's going on. And then now, because the tools are so readily available and, you know, platforms such as what you're offering allows people to access research and then make better decisions and choices. And this is just happens to be something I'm doing right now. I am I am looking to get my body weight down because I let it get up a little high with a lot of travel and not being on my diet the way I normally am. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's like, okay, you know, let's 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 cut let's cut you know a little bit of weight and get down to closer to a, a more contest condition. Although I haven't competed in years, just hmm. just just to play, just to yeah. play around with it. Yeah, I know we're rabbit hole in a lot, but I have one other question for you about this protocol with these weight training routines that you're doing, uh, specifically in the fasted state. Are you finding a, a certain uh, velocity uh, in terms of your your weight training speed, or a certain number of reps and sets that you're unable to hit in that fasted state? Uh, I would say on a on a on a. 10 rep exercise and so i'm running anywhere from three to five in this sequence all the way up to like 200 rep push-ups in a so i would say on my endurance based ones i don't see that much but as i get down below 10 i definitely see a drop off in you know kind of force force parameters by bow you know if i normally can do five reps i would be down to maybe three and if I normally can do 10, it would be eight. So the, the higher up the threshold goes, the, the bigger the drop off is. Yeah, I've primarily found when for any of my weight training workouts in a fasted state, my primary deficits lie in anything that becomes mildly glycolytic. So the time under tension component, meaning like if I'm doing anything that kind of exceeds my ability to be able to burn creatine and begins to dip into glucose, which tends to be a little bit depleted in a fasted state, uh, my performance suffers. So anything, any, any weight training set that exceeds about 30 seconds or any high intensity interval training length that exceeds about 30 seconds, that's where I really start to drop off if I'm in a fasted state. And that, yeah. that seems to be, uh, pretty consistent with some of the research that's been done on say like CrossFitters, uh, and power lifters and, and weightlifters who are working in a, in a, in a fasted state, you know, for a typical CrossFit workout, if it's something like a, like a snatch ladder, for example, where it's really, really quick, powerful efforts that could 
arguably rely upon creatine, then there's not that big of a deficit. But as soon as you get into like, say, um, uh, like a 750 meter row or something like that, that's where you really start to see issues pop up as far as performance is concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How about you, Matt? What, what, uh, what crazy things have you been up to? <laughs> All right. So again, more, more of a psychological mental process to get ready for the call. Uh, first I microdosed Vivance, which is a drug. Uh, so make sure you get a prescription. Very powerful. I, I for me, works better than I've never done Adderall or Ritalin cause I don't like the potential consequences. Modafinil for me genetically is a no go. Uh, it says it right mm. in my genetic test. So Vivance, about 10 milligrams, you get like these 40 milligram capsules to 10 milligrams of that. And that just sharpens the brain. Is about, Vivance uh, like, like uh, Adderall or what exactly is it? It's, it's in that zone. It's not as addictive. I'll do it maybe like once a month. Um, I know this was a big call, so I wanted to get as ready as I could. Um, yeah, you can go let's go V Y V A N C E. And so, then, so it's uh, basically couple, like an amphetamine. It's in that, <clears throat> it's in that family. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah. you don't, you don't get jittery or, or, uh, you have, have like, you know, nausea or any of those kind of side effects with it. No, no. And again, I'm, huh. I'm doing a quarter. I, I, I wouldn't do a full one. I know people that have, and they said they were just flying. I can just imagine. So hmm. again, the, the, po- the poison is always the dose, right? With everything that we do. Um, and then a couple sticks of Lucy gum. So thanks for that. Oh yeah. Cup. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. The, the nicotine then, gum that's, that's got slightly gum, yeah. lower levels of artificial sweeteners and crap in it than a lot of other gums. It's got, and, and it's, uh, yeah, from what I understand with Lucy, it's it's more of like a slow release formula. You're, it's designed to like chew for a little while, then kind of like tip into the or or uh, tuck into the, the pouch of your gums or your cheeks and hold there for a little while, almost like a, a tobacco chew, and then kind of you, you chew on a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And then uh, being the uh, kind of the the main guy in charge of formulating products, I'm trying this new Shen blend of Asian herbs that's going to be just part of a new product that we're going to release probably in December. Mm. We'll probably come back to talk about that, but we're, we're really working on the brain below, AKA the p- producing neurotransmitters from the gut. And it's a very powerful blend. You I literally feel like almost like more light in my brain and, and kind of a sense of calmness. So when I do stack stimulants, I like to stack things that will also uh, balance my nervous system. So things like either lavender oil, uh, L-theanine, or the Shen blend is doing a great job. So w- when I do the two together, I feel both very sharp and at the same time a little bit relaxed, which is really kind of an ideal state to be in, in my opinion. Huh. Cool. Nice. Well, uh, so so you're on Adderall and nicotine, and Wade not Adderall. Has, and, let's, let's be clear, Vivance, Vivance. And, and Wade <laughs> hasn't eaten, so this should be an interesting show. I, I guess I should go real quick too, just so I can I can try to one up you guys. I did yeah, sure um I, I did a blood draw this morning. I I do a quarterly like huge blood draw. So I I went down to uh, the the lab core and gave about 19 tubes of blood, and then on my way home. I decided I wanted to go swimming, so I dropped into the YMCA because I have a, a triathlon I'm competing in this weekend, and they just refilled the pool, and so they told me, they're like, the the pool, by the way, is at 68 degrees. So I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's chilly, but it's doable. So I got in there, and I swam for like a half hour. I'm still goose bumping. My wife just asked me why my lips were blue. So I've gotten my cold thermogenesis in and uh i i also tried to get my brain ready for today's show matt so i did peptides i've been experimenting with a new peptide stack for uh for for things like neurogenesis and neuroplasticity and it's actually which peptides are you on so it's a, it's a very, I'm, I'm, I'm totally passionate and, yeah. and I've been going crazy on SARMs, peptides and hormones yeah. the last two, three months. Which yeah. peptides are you on for the brain? It's a very good stack. Uh, and I, uh, if you go to peptide society.org, there's, there's some docs you could find to prescribe. Um, and, and, uh, I have a guy who gets me this stuff from tailor made compounding, but it's topical dihexa. So you apply this on the carotid artery on either side of the neck 
and that's combined with uh, a subcutaneous injection in the abdomen of C-Max, pineallin, mm-hmm. and cortigen, mm-hmm. along with uh, one spray of intranasal C-Max. So it's both C-Max subcutaneously and then also intranasally. And that stack is just out of sight when it comes to really good, clean, non-jittery energy. And a lot of the research on these peptides show that they assist with memory formation, uh, especially this uh, this um, uh, pineal and cortisone compound, and then also uh, learning consolidation, and then also, of course, just like neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, and a significant decrease in brain inflammation. And then if you're, if you're really low on sleep, you combine that with BPC-157, which also does a really good job for neural inflammation. So I've, I've uh, got my cold water swim, my peptides, and the last thing I'm doing right now is I'm messing around with all these different grounding and earthing mats and patches because i got this guy I'm interviewing named Clint Ober, who's like a grounding, earthing kind of expert, and he sent me all these all these products to test out. So right now I've got a patch attached to both of my feet, and there, there's a cable extending from the patch out my office door, and then it's attached to a grounding rod outside in the grass. So basically I've got, I've got double grounding going on on both feet right now which is supposed to do a pretty good job at decreasing inflammation. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to find out from the results of this blood draw that I did because I've been doing this for the past week, and I want to see if it, if it dipped any inflammatory markers at all. So between the three of us, we probably sound to most folks like we have way too much time on our hands, and we're a bunch of, of bored middle-aged men with too much money to spend on, on, uh, on crazy hacking devices. So. Well, well, you know what? We're the pioneers that are going to take the arrows for everyone else. <laughs> That's right. And at, at, the, end of, at the end of the honorably. day, <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, hey, listen. I mean, we, when we get old and we age, we have an option, right? The choice is: Are you going to fight aging and even prevent? A lot, I mean, of course, our skin ages and a lot of our systems age. But for example, muscle mass. A lot of our brain, um, different parts of our brain, we can reverse aging in a lot of these components using things like peptide, of course, exercise, neurofeedback. So that's what we're all about, and, and that's why we're we're friends, and that's why Wade and I are partners, and I think we're doing the world – we're changing the paradigm of what's possible because most people – you know, they just get old, they, they start falling apart the last 10, 15 years, and then they, they die. Um, I saw it firsthand. My grandfather lived, my, my dad built an apartment for my grandfather, so I, I got a chance to see him live his last 10 years of his life. He, he got hit by a car but 10 years before he passed, so he, he had a very hard time walking, and then mm. I just saw him get on all these different medications and drugs and literally he just wanted to die and that was very impactful and and wade i don't know if you want to share your sister's story um that i know impacted wade uh, dramatically as well yeah my my sister well i was four years my senior got cancer when i was 15 years old and i watched literally over the four years of her go through the medical model of decline until she died at 22 and that kind of set me on the direction of going well two things and tragic as that is the the upside of it was and there's always an upside to every tragic thing and i think it's important for people to recognize not to wallow in tragedy was that you know life isn't a guarantee and your health isn't a guarantee she was a great athlete. And the funny part about that is, is we make an assumption if you're a great athlete that you're going to live a long time. The evidence doesn't support that. (laughs) And the other thing is, is that we all think that we're going to live a lot longer, a lot stronger than we actually are. So there's a couple of normalcy biases that we just assume and, and smashing through those. And for me, it was an interruption early in life that kind of set me on this pathway. And for Matt, it was later on as he saw, you know, looked into the future and, and, and saw what aging looked like. And so from those two perspectives, uh, we kind of combine different paradigms. And of course, we have lots of times we have con- what would some people would appear to be conflictive philosophies, Matt and I. And I think that's a good thing um, as company, uh, building a company so that we're, we're able to challenge each other or do different experiences as opposed to living in some kind of echo chamber where we only do one thing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and you know, I, I know you guys are, 
you're, you're looking into a lot of things, especially as owners of a supplement company uh, and also folks who are as passionate about this kind of stuff as myself. And I would love to segue into the topic at hand, which is this idea mm -hmm. of nutrigenomics and um, ketosis particularly. I know it's something we're going to really dive into. But Matt, when you mentioned to me that you really had been doing a lot in the realm of nutrigenomics and looking into diet personalization and some of the genetic influences on diet, what exactly were you referring to? Can you, can you uh, fill the listeners in on what it is you guys have been looking at? Yeah. <clears throat> so here's, in my opinion, like the seven main keys to biologically optimize your diet. So the number one, which I think is always key to hold in front of us, is sustainability. So th that's more of a psychological thing. In other words, you know, Wade, for example, is, you know, he has his spiritual reasons for doing vegetarianism and that's what works for him, you know? So that, that, supersedes any other variables and that's really important and you know we all have our psychological limitations so sustainability i think is number one there's also physical sustainability that's part of that two is lifestyle three is genetics which we're going to get deep into four is looking at allergies food sensitivities five is gut biome six is biofeedback and seven is your goals so i think you got to look at all seven of these different variables to really dial in your diet, your nutrition plan, your strategy to hit all of these different variables. So in okay. other words, is it sustainable? Does it match my lifestyle? Is it, does it match my genetics? Am I obviously eliminating foods that I'm allergic to or have sensitivities to? Is it food that's aligned with my gut biome? Looking at your biofeedback and obviously blood work and seeing, okay, is, is, am I heading the wrong direction? Do I have some, some issues that I should correct? And then, of course, you know, is your goal muscle building? Is it fat loss? Is it athletic performance? Is it mental performance? Is it anti-aging? And really, you know, at Bioptimizers, we, we feel that all things fall into three categories. It's either aesthetic goals, it's either performance, mental or physical, or it's health, which, you know, you could say things like aging and, and things like that or anti-aging are part of that. So that's, that's how we look at uh, the diet from a very high-level perspective. Okay, and and from what I understand, what you're saying is that third component that you were just referring to amongst those mm -hmm. seven genetics is the one that you've been focused on most intensively. Yeah, again, been going really deep. Um, so let's just start from a macro perspective and look at you know let's, let's rewind, let's let's take a time machine, go back ten thousand, twenty thousand years ago, and you know people that were Northern European, Caucasians, obviously there was very hard winters. And for people with that genetic background, keto typically makes a lot of sense because, you know, the winter time, and, and again, I'm, I'm from Canada, very hard winters. I can, I can easily imagine what that was like. Um, just finding an animal to kill, I'm sure was a, was a tough experience and a tough journey. Obviously there's no fruits, there's no vegetation. So your body had to adapt to a keto based diet. And one of the key things to understand is, is how epigenetics get passed on um, generation to generation to generation. They did that experiment with worms about a year and a half, two years ago. And this with worms, they found that epigenetics got passed on 18 generations. So literally what you're doing um, is going to get passed on to your grand, 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 grandchildren. So all the good stuff that you're doing, Ben, uh, is going to create some really good uh, genetics down the line. So that is very important to understand. Obviously, also, we know that uh, most of the mitochondria comes from our mom. That's another variable to look at. So even just looking at, you know, what your grandfather did, how your grandfather ate, your grand grandfather, all of those things are things that will give us some clues. Now, I live in Panama, right? And in Panama, we're much closer to the equator. And there's an abundance of fruits all year long, right? There's banana trees, mango trees. I mean, all you know, you could live on the streets in Panama. Like you could live in total poverty, not starve, because there's always an abundance of fruit somewhere. So people here, genetically, again, I'm just generalizing, but they tend to be able to eat more carbs and respond better. And then obviously then there's Mediterranean genetics, which also kind of has an abundance of food. So that was the, we'll dive deep into different genes in a, in a minute, but I just wanted to kind of give the big picture that um, fat intake increases the further up you go and then plant intake 
increases the closer you get to the equator. Meaning that the human body tends to biochemically respond more favorably to carbohydrate-dense foods when it's located closer to the equator or exposed to plenty of sunshine, whereas there are more favorable adaptations to higher amounts of fat and or omega-3s and DHA in colder climates? Well, I'm talking about genetically, right? So, like, I still have my Caucasian genetics, mm-hmm. right? So, so keto still is the best diet plan for me personally. But I'm just talking about people that, again, have more uh, African genetics or, you know, that have been gen- genes that have been closer to the equator historically. And you can see that in your 23andMe. Typically, they'll do better with plants than they will on keto, and then again, people that have Northern European genetics tend to do better on keto. So again, I'm just generalizing, but it's an important uh, macro perspective to start at. I think. Yeah, although not not to get into the weeds too much, I would say that you know when you when you say someone could do better on plants than on keto, I think I would I would push back a little bit and say that one could eat a relatively plant rich diet and still be in a ketogenic state. Uh, but when, when you're talking about the inclusion of plants for folks who live closer to the equator, you're probably talking about a lot of these vitamin C, more sugary, you know, citrusy fruits and some of the, some of the type of plants and produce that might not actually be, uh, that friendly to, to staying in a consistent ketogenic state. Yeah. So if you want, we can really start nerding out here on some genes. So I guess let's start with vegetarian genes. Speaking of plants. Um, one of the carb digestion genetics is called, uh, Amy one. So A M Y one. And basically it's, um, it's a gene that obviously influences amylase, which obviously at optimizers were all about car- enzymes and digestion begins in the mouth. As we start digesting food, our brain recognizes, okay, this is a carb. Let me produce amylase. So it's very important long term that your body can produce amylase. And obviously you can take uh, amylase with enzymes, which we we sell. So that is one gene. Another one is lactase genetics. So there's you know LCT, MCM6, which are involved in in lactase um, breakdown. So again, mm-hmm. some people obviously that have lactose problems probably don't have these genes. Then there's the FUT and SHBG genes, which you know as far as fiber in the diet and, and B12 um, certainly affect that. Then there's also the um, the FADS1 gene, which is a really big one because we're talking about being able to biosynthesize omega-3s and omega-6s uh, from polyunsaturated fatty acids. So in terms of being able to get the fatty acids from plants and be able to, to synthesize them, that is a really important gene for vegetarians to look at. Then we can look at BCMO1, which is polymorphisms in the BCMO1 gene, uh, PEMT activity, especially for women. So that's more of a choline uh, genetic. So people, especially women in premenopause or menopause or vegetarians are especially in need of choline with falling estrogen levels. So if you look at your, you know, the MTFR genes and other things can make things worse. So those are all different genes to look at for vegetarians. Now, if we shift over to keto. And, and just to interrupt real quick, what you're saying yeah, is that for, for those specific genetic parameters, and, and mm-hmm. do let me know if you have those written down somewhere or if you'd be able to send them to me so I could put them in the show notes for people who want to say – pull up their 23andMe results and look at each of these genes. But what you're mm-hmm. saying is that the appropriateness of whether or not someone might thrive on a plant-based diet is going to be dictated by some of these genes that might, say, allow you to generate more DHA from plant-based fats or allow you to more readily digest uh, some of the starches and sugars that tend to be more predominant in a plant-based diet. And so you could actually look and see, okay, I'm considering a plant-based diet, but genetically I may or may not be adapted to that based on these specific, you know, I I think you named what, five there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that, and and it's not saying that again, let's say for spiritual reasons or whatever reason you you want to do vegetarianism and you might not have the genes. You can obviously still hack it. But if you're aware that, for example, um, you might not have the FADS1 gene, 
then you, you might need to be more mindful and have a sh- strategy around your omega-3s and omega-6s. And I know Wade, for example, um, it's one of the things that he, he's always mindful of is which, which fat sources he's using. So I think that's a big one. Um, and again, it's not saying you can't or cannot do keto or vegetarianism. And I'm, for the record, I'm keto, which we're going to get into in a sec. But looking at these genes and then saying, okay, I don't, I don't have the gene to break down lactose, then I, I can take lactase. Or I don't have the AB1 gene, so let me take amylase. So again, we could hack things with supplements and other ways, which I think if you're aware of, and you you solve, then you're going to prevent problems. If you're not aware, and you you do something that's perhaps damaging your body for a very long period of time, then it can lead to health issues. So, I think that's a big parameter to look at. And then for people that are diet agnostic, which really I am. I mean, I don't really care uh, what I do as long as it works. I'm a pragmatist at heart. So uh, then looking at these things and saying, okay, this is the best diet for me. That's what I go with. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about one thing that is going to allow you to fall asleep for an afternoon nap and not wake up groggy, to settle you down at the end of the day when you want a nice tea to sip on that kind of kicks the butt of chamomile or valerian or anything else, any of these other purported relaxation teas that you drink and they don't work and you lay there with your eyes bugging out your head, staring awake at the ceiling at night. Not this stuff. It's an adaptogenic mushroom. It's called Rishi, R-E-I-S-H-I, Rishi. And what my friends at Four Sigmatic have done is created this into a super tasty elixir. They make a lot of stuff. Like they use lion's mane, they've got cordyceps, they've got coffee with all sorts of mushrooms in it. But this Rishi, I literally will dump two packets of it into my mouth many times before I settle down for an afternoon nap. And it just does a great job shutting down your system, but you don't get that post-snap grogginess or that post-sleep grogginess that like a hefty, huge dose of, you know, CBD or something like that might give you. So try out this Rishi or, or anything from Four Sigmatic for that matter. You get a 15% discount. You go to foursigmatic.com slash Ben Greenfield. That's F-O-U-R sigmatic.com slash Ben Greenfield. And uh, the code that you can use over there is Ben Greenfield. Finally, before we jump back in with Matt and Wade, let me tell you why you probably, if you could smell me right now, would want to eat my armpits. I'm not kidding. I literally, just before I went down to record this for you, put coconut vanilla deodorant into my armpits. But this isn't any old deodorant filled with aluminum and parabens and talc and all these other nasty ingredients. Instead, it's filled with ingredients found in nature like coconut oil and shea butter and tapioca starch. This stuff isn't tested on animals. It is completely guilt-free. You could eat it. It's still not as good as a ribeye, but you could eat it. Uh, And not only that, but they've got free returns and free exchanges, and it's called Native, Native Deodorants. Uh, You go to nativedeodorant.com slash nothing. Just go to nativedeodorant.com. Go to nativedeodorant.com and use discount code Ben, that's going to give you 20% off your first purchase from Native Deodorants. And uh, if you use promo code Ben during checkout, that's going to give you 20% off your first purchase. It gives you all the free shipping and free exchanges in case you don't like coconut vanilla and want to try lavender rose or cucumber mint or eucalyptus mint. Uh, But it's very simple. NativeDeodorant.com. Use promo code Ben. That's going to give you 20% off free returns, free exchanges, and this stuff smells absolutely bomb. Okay. So so when you're talking about some of these genes, are there actually any large-scale human studies that have taken a group and said, okay, here are your genes that dictate your, your, your amylase production, your lactose sensitivities, mm-hmm your ability to be able to generate usable fats from plant-based sources like seeds and nuts, and then place those people on a plant-based diet and analyze whether or not the response was favorable compared to a non-plant-based diet or a carnivore diet or a keto diet or anything like that. Because the reason I ask this is I know, for example, DNA Fit collected, I believe it was 16 different genetic polymorphisms related to exercise response, and they indeed did have a group train according to whether or not they appeared based on those polymorphisms to be better adapted to endurance 
versus better adapted to power. And they found that when folks trained according to their genetic polymorphisms, they saw a faster, more efficient fitness response. Uh, But have they done the same thing yet with some of these genes you're talking about with food? With think a lot of them, they haven't, but uh, that's a great question to segue into the keto genes. One study they did was with the Eskimos and the Inuits, which they found this one gene called CPT1A, which is an Arctic mutation for fatty oxidation. And we're going to go really deep into fatty acid oxidation today uh, because that is really the key to keto, in my opinion. But they found this gene found in the liver and kidneys responsible for ketogenesis as the key regulator for importing long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria to help maintain energy, normal blood sugar levels when carbohydrate intake is low, which by the way, we have completely hacked with Capex. Um, so even if you don't have that gene, we've got the answer, which we'll, we'll get into. Yeah. When you say, when you say Capex, that's not a gene, that's an actual product that you guys are working on developing to enhance the ability to be able to, to get into ketosis. Yeah, it's out, it's released, and it literally does pretty much the exact same thing as this gene does. All right, let's so, talk more about that later. So so, so back to these ketogenic genes. Yeah, so this CPT1A uh, increases the heat in the body to stay warm in a cold climate by directly uh, by directing sorry, free fatty acids away from the liver cells to brown fat and a greater capacity for gluconeogenesis. So basically, you, you just perform better on low carbs with this gene. And that's, again, there was an Eskimo Inuit study. Um, so that is one, one example. And uh, they looked at, so 81% of Canadians and 54% of Greenland Inuits and 68% of Northeastern Siberian population have the variants of the CPT1A gene. And, um, yeah, so that's a really good one to, to look at for, for keto. Now, uh, to answer your question, though, I think the answer is no for the most part. So, again, we're still in the realm of, of theories and opinions. But I think the realm of nutrigenomics is definitely one of the most exciting uh, fields to look at. And I think there's going to be a lot of data coming out in the next five to ten years. Uh, so moving on to more keto genes, FAD1 and FAD2. So if you look at the analysis of ancient DNA reveal that prior to human farming, the animal-based diets of European hunter-gatherers predominantly favor the opposite version of the same gene, which limits the activity of FADS1 enzymes better suited for people on meat and seafood diet. So the FAD1 and FAD2 inability to convert plant omega-3 fatty acids to EPA and DHA showing another pathway that is enable, enabling high intake of animal-based omega-3s. So again, if you have these genes, you're just going to be able to eat more uh, animal fats and fish fats and perform better. Eat more animal fats and fish fats than someone who might not be able to assimilate those as well? Exactly. You okay. know, if you don't have the, the right genes, then you, you might struggle. Now, if someone does not have the correct genes to assimilate animal fats, does that dictate that those animal fats are going to be inflammatory or atherosclerotic for them, or that they simply would not produce as much, say, you know, bioabsorbable DHA from the consumption of fish? It's a good question, but again, Capex is the answer, because, <laughs> uh, or part of the answer, because we have the lipase to help digest that and then break that down to small fatty acids and transport them into the mitochondria, into the liver, and then burn them up. So yes, I mean, probably be more issues, but again, it is hackable in my opinion. Okay. So I I think I see where you're going here. What you're saying is some people would struggle on a ketogenic or a low carbohydrate diet based on genetic factors and that what you're proposing is that those could somehow be hacked by doing things like upregulating lipase uh, availability, amylase availability, et cetera, through the use of targeted supplementation. Exactly. Okay, got it. So you feel crappy on a ketogenic diet. It turns out that part of that is because you aren't genetically uh, adapted or it might not be the most genetically favorable thing for you to consume you still want the benefits of it. So then you use better living through science to start to, to put some things in your body to allow you to digest and assimilate fats in a manner that mm-hmm. allows you to eat like a low carb, high fat diet. Exactly. Okay. Now let's, 
let's keep going here. So there's saturated fat intake genetics. So there's ADRB2, which plays a role in energy balance and metabolism. And it's considered the thrifty gene because it makes our body more efficient using as few calories as possible. So people that have a hard time getting really lean probably have this gene. In other words, like the diet starts and they, they lose fat, they, they start getting, but then their body adapts and then they can't, they, they really struggle to lose that last, you know, 10, 20 pounds of, of body fat. That just means that they're probably very efficient, which, you know, going back, tens of thousands of years ago was probably a great thing if you were going to starve for a very long period of time and be walking, looking for food, um, that adaptation kept us alive. But, you know, right now, unfortunately, we don't need it, but a lot of us still have that. Another one is APOA2, that's eat fat, get fat gene, uh, the satiation gene. So this enzyme regulates appetite. So again, there's, and I, and I could get even more nerdy, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it here because we can talk about all the variants uh there's the fto3 the gene which is the called the hangry dream hangry gene has to do with with ghrelin so the fto gene impacts your overall body fat depending on how much fat you eat especially saturated fat um there's the lpl gene which helps modulate whether saturated fats are stored as body fat or burned as fuel and plays a role in how saturated fats are broken down for energy there's the apoc c3 gene so this gene is important in regulating blood triglyceride levels as well as LDL, which is the more dangerous type. So again, people that have uh, cholesterol issues probably look at that. And just to shift over, um, and again, I could keep going. There's a bunch of them. But there's also fasting genes, which is really interesting because a friend of mine here in Panama, he's, he's a keto coach. And when he fasts, he gets the opposite response that I do. His HRV drops, his his heartbeat his goes up so for him it's a stressor and obviously i think that's a genetic thing for some people maybe it's psychological but for me you know when i fast and, and i'll fast for like 60 hours a week on top of just eating one meal a day most of the time and my hrv always improves like all all my biofeedback says yeah our body is very happy doing that um, so that, that is a big one. So for, they call it the PPAR alpha gene or the, the coastal adaptation gene. So if, if we go back to, again, the, uh, Mediterranean, <laughs> the, uh, Mediterranean, uh, atmosphere, there was a lot of berries, blueberries, mulberries, cranberries, raw almonds, olives, all of these things grew in abundance. So for these people, Fasting, again, people with these genetics, fasting is probably not a good thing for them, which is, I know, and, and again, the poison is the dose, but again, looking at your biofeedback, going back to these seven keys to biologically optimizing your diet, your biofeedback is always telling. So if you're using things like uh, the BioStrap or the Aura Ring or whatever, seeing, hey, is fasting improving my metrics or are they making them worse is, is really the key. Okay. All right. So uh, one question I have based on this, Wade, you uh, follow a plant-based diet largely from what I understand combined with the bodybuilding. Have you actually tested your genes and found yourself to be one of these people who is genetically not favored for a ketogenic diet or – um, well, 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 I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about that because I just wonder, you know, with you having followed this type of diet you're following right now for so long, are you doing that because you discovered that actually tended to be pretty compatible with your genetics? Yeah, great question. So <clears throat> when it comes to myself, um, I didn't do well on a ketogenic diet. However, I was attempting to do a ketogenic diet on a plant-based diet. So that didn't work for me. Um, I do have the capability to do a ketogenic diet if I chose to use animal foods. And so one of the things that, you know, I used to be a carnivore way back in the day in my early bodybuilding days uh, when I was young. And then I switched over, I think, in 2001 to a plant-based diet. And it was more of an experiment, you know, again, another radical experiment to kind of see what I could do. And that was one of the reasons that was interesting that was the founding of why we got into this is because – um, I would attempt to do the ketogenic diet on a plant-based diet, 
And it just didn't work for me. Now, I'll put a caveat there. Even though I have the genetic capability for it, again, I'm not doing what I would call a traditional ketogenic diet. Uh, And I feel great on a plant-based diet, which is kind of interesting as well. And I do seem to have the genetics to support that as well. So I'm... It's, it, I'm kind of an unusual case, and uh, but my choice is, you know, if I went to a ketogenic diet and I was doing plants, I would probably do really well. On a plant base, I wasn't able to, and then we invented uh, the Capex product to kind of compromise bridging that gap so that I could go down that route. Now, I haven't fully embraced a, a ketogenic plant-based diet yet. I'm still playing with the Capex as someone who still is on a carbohydrate dominant diet to see what the effects are for someone who's not on a ketogenic diet and still has the supportive genes to you know be okay on a plant-based diet. So and that by the end of the year, I think I'll be in a position where I can kind of go the other way because I'm not done the research now. We just did another blood draw the other day. I'm waiting for the results back to see what the see what's happening. Okay, got it. Well, and I got to jump in here and just say that uh, just looking at reality and, and Wade's results in the past, I mean, and Wade likes to call himself a carbivore. <laughs> uh, Wade does really well on carbs. So Wade for sure has great genetics. I mean, Wade got shredded over and over again on a high carb diet, low fat. Um, so Wade for sure has great genetics to eat carbs, where if I would have followed his diet, I would not have gotten the same results for sure. I, I, I tried it. There's yeah. one other thing. There's one other thing I would add to it. And let's not um, disregard what I would call uh, lifestyle damage or interventions. So for example, what I've noticed is a lot of people who ate a lot of sugar as kids um, seem to have trouble metabolizing carbs. And for me, uh, I think some of my I, I'd say experiment, experiments and, and drugs and stuff like that may have damaged some of my fat metabolizing pathways, like lipolytic pathways. So well, it's not in, let's not completely discount lifestyle or, or environment on what's happening to a person and solely base everything on genetics. I, I agree 100% because I, I was the high sugar kid. You know? And uh, for sure, that affected my gut biome on some level. Right. It, it probably affected my epigenetics as well. So the other thing, too, is, again, we, we cannot underestimate epigenetics. So, again, all the things that Wade has done has switched on a lot of genes and switched off other ones. And same thing goes for me. So, yeah, I was the high sugar kid and, and that could have permanently affected things and made um my, my ability to, to use carbs a lot less effective. Well, it affects the biome pretty significantly too, in terms of the pharmaceutical bacterioid ratio and some of the, some of the microbiome elements that would be responsible for contributing to say like carbohydrate cravings, the ability to be able to digest carbohydrates efficiently, et cetera. And the nice part about that is that in many cases, once you have eliminated or or weaned yourself off of carbohydrates, sugars, and starches, you can actually shift your microbiome favorably. Although even that, based on the research I've seen, does require some tweaking of the diet based on on prebiotics like uh, pomegranate seed extract and, and grapefruit extract, oregano. Like There's a variety of herbal compounds that can actually help to shift the biome when you're shifting your macronutrient ratio to kind of reduce a lot of these cravings and and some of the work by that or on that has been done in Israel and is related to uh, Rob Wolf's book Wired to Eat. So I'll I'll link to that research in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash upgrade keto. And then there's also a podcast that'll hunt down uh, I believe it was a podcast recorded by the guys at ATP Science and they also went into in into some of these some of these compounds that can help to shift that biome uh, a little bit more favorably towards, uh, t- towards you know, like specifically a decrease in, in sugar and starch consumption. So I'll hunt down some of that research and put it in the show notes for folks. But what I'd like to do is hear a little bit more about uh, this idea behind Capex, which you brought up a few times. And, and really, all I know about it at this point is you sent me a preliminary bottle like six months ago, and Matt told me, be careful, don't take this any time other than like the morning or before noon, because it gives you so much energy, you're going to have a hard time sleeping. 
Um, he said it would give me, despite very high fat intake, I would be able to poop like a baby and not have a lot of the constipation that people get on a ketogenic diet. And uh, he also said it would upregulate my metabolism and I'd see a, a, a noticeable spark in fat loss. So I started using it. Um, I think you sent me two bottles since then. And I've been taking five a day just in the morning just to experiment with it, see what it's like. Um, poops have been good. Energy has been good. I did try taking it in the afternoon a couple times and similar to what you experienced, Matt, couldn't fall asleep to like about midnight to 1 a.m. ish. And again, which is weird because it doesn't have caffeine in it. And I, I want to kind of take a deep dive into the biochemistry of this thing. Um, and, and so, so that's what I know about Capex right now. Uh, where's the best place to dive into this formulation, how it works and, and, and what some of the common mistakes on keto are and how it might address those? Yeah, I guess the formulation started by looking at the struggles that a lot of people have on keto. And keep in mind, I've been doing keto for 26 years, not nonstop, but uh, probably, you know, almost 50% of that time. So for a lot of times, that's cycled back and forth. And now I've been nonstop for over four years. So the issues, and I've coached a lot of people on keto, like I've coached keto coaches, and I, you know, I'm very familiar with the problem. So the first issue is a lot of constipation. I think that's the big one. Uh, and, and that relates to either lipase deficiencies or not enough bile production. So the first thing I wanted to do was to solve that, which we did. So we have a four lipase blend. We call it Lipe 4. It's got four different lipases designed to break fat down. The second part of that is the dandelion root extract, which stimulates bile production. So that combination of the light four and the dandelion root extract takes care of the fats. Now, if you're keto, you're also eating protein. So we, we included the same triphase protease blend. So that's three different proteases that is found in mass zymes, plus the HCL, which will help you break down the amino acids uh, from the protein. We also included astrozyme, which is an astralagus-based ingredient that transports up to 66% more aminos through the intestinal tract into your bloodstream, which is really critical. I mean, because ultimately, if you want to be able to assimilate these amino acids into your muscle tissue, they need to cross the intestinal tract, right? I mean, even if you break them down in your stomach and you break them down in your intestinal tract, and but they don't cross over, then they're, they're not going to benefit you. So that's the, the digestive component of it. But that was just part one. Okay, so that's to solve the digestive issues. So what we're talking about here would be for people who are genetically predisposed to not be able to produce high enough amounts of lipase or digest fats efficiently, or for people who who might just be shifting into higher amounts of fat than their enzyme production might be accustomed to, this would be a lipase blend of four different lipases. And I think the label says LIP4TM. I assume that's just like the patented term for, for the four different lipases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's our and, blend. And so that, blend. that would increase the ability to be able to digest fat more efficiently. And it would increase the amount of HCL produced and bile produced to enhance digestion. Correct. Now, this is not just for people that have... Uh, issues with lipase because you're going to see where we go with the product. This product is also designed for people that just want all day energy without relying on stimulants. Or of course you can stack it with stimulants like I did today. I took my Capex and I mean, it's eight to 10 hours. I mean, maybe even 12 hours of just constant energy. We're, we're going to get into the mechanisms of how that works. But in order to make that happen, we need the fatty acids from the fats, which is what the light four does. So even if, again, even if you got nice lipase production, we still want to just maximize the breakdown of fats into small fatty acids so that we can drive them to our mitochondria and burn them up. Okay. So the second big problem that happens with keto is a drop in peak athletic performance, right? And we know that from usually it takes about a year, right? There's, in my opinion, there's three or four levels of fat adaptation. The first one is the keto flu stage, the first 
10 to 14 days, which by the way, you can solve using ketone esters or ketone salts. That's an easy one. Second one's around three months. And at that point, you can start like carb cycling, in my opinion, and, and not fall out of keto. The third one's about a year. And that's the one where it, usually your athletic performance goes up. And I'm talking about like peak athletic performance, people that train really hard. And I know that when Wade went on keto um, one of the first times, he struggled at the gym a little bit. Wade, you want to talk about that? Yeah, there was, you know, because I do a lot of, obviously, I did, you know, do a lot of heavy lifting um, in that kind of bodybuilding range of reps, not so much on the powerlifting side. But, you know, there was a real, I, I just didn't have any pop or energy in my workouts. And I was like, that, you know, I just struggle with that uh, when I tried keto and couldn't make the jump. Uh, and part of one of my, my, my experience we talked about earlier today is can I still have a pretty good workouts on no food? And uh, it's part of the experiments that we're doing in this keto project or this keto yeah, project. Which in talk maybe about the well, difference that Capex made on your workouts, Wade, as far as like the before and after on like when, when you're on low food, low carbs. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 undeniable that I'm able to maintain. Uh, actually, I think my force output has actually improved on the process uh, since I've been using it. And as, as evidence in my workouts and my tracking my results, it's been superior in the last few months than it has been in the last few years. Of course, I'm in my late 40s and you kind of expect a bit of a decline, but now I'm seem, seemingly to be on an upswing. So, for example, on my DEXA scan, I actually put on a pound of muscle and I'm not using any other uh, like SARMs or anabolics or anything else. So, you know, that that's I, I haven't put on a pound of muscle and years <laughs> yeah and, <laughs> you know and, and, and when, when you're talking about a ketogenic diet inhibiting broad athletic performance you know i th i think again we'd probably have to get into the weeds a little bit more because you know like i think i was talking with you about this matt i was part of jeff volick's faster study at university of connecticut where you know he had me and a group of endurance athletes follow a strict ketogenic diet 90 percent plus fat for 12 months and then had another group of athletes follow a traditional uh, endurance athlete diet of around 50 to 60 percent ish carbohydrate, in some cases up to 80 percent. And then they brought us into the lab and did a range of tests from VO2 max testing to endurance testing, time to exhaustion, et cetera, along with, with muscle and fat biopsies. And they actually found a zero deleterious impact on endurance performance. Uh, and even VO2 max with the ketogenic diet. And, and again, I think, I think the area where, where I think the area where people are held back the most, where, where they might actually benefit from something like this would be if you're competing in a sport that has glycolytic demands on a regular basis. And, and by that, I mean, you're competing in a sport where you have certain periods of time during the week where during your workout or during your competition, you have to go hard for about 30 seconds to three minutes or so. And if you fall into that category, that's definitely where I think you could be hampered by a ketogenic diet unless you're doing some things you know, like this, for example, to actually allow you to be able to hit those glycolytic ranges. Yeah. No, I I'm 100. percent So, so when we're talking, about, when I'm talking about uh, decreased performance, it's more on the anaerobic side. Yeah. On the aerobic side, we know we know that keto is 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 awesome because it's almost like an, an endless energy supply. Yeah. So it's more like when I say intense uh, exercise, it's more anaerobic, uh, which obviously weightlifting is or all kinds of different things are. But even even and just for the record, I broke um, a leg press record that I had literally hadn't broken in 20 two years. Um, I think I was on seven caps of Capex and I like pressed over a thousand pounds, which I hadn't done in, in 22 years. So there's definitely, even for me, who's been on keto nonstop for four years and on and off for 26, it is definitely a jump. And, and keep in mind, like, you know, I, I, I like press all the time. So it wasn't like it was a new thing. And I, and I, you know, it was just like, no, there was a, a huge, huge jump in, in performance. Hmm. Um, so, so I think even for endurance athletes, and we're going to get into the mechanism in a second, um, it's a big one. And the third one is, is energy. Now, some, a, a lot of people get more energy on keto, but some people don't. And again, it's probably genetic related. 
But regardless of if you got genes or not, the capex will increase your energy because what we're doing, we got the fatty acids broken down, right? We talked about that. That's phase one. The second component is the L-carnitine, which is nothing new. But again, it's the way it works with this entire process. We, this is true synergy. We're transporting these fatty acids into our liver and into the muscle mitochondria. And then the third thing we're doing using InnoSlim, 7-Keto just, just, just to back up a second, that's what you were mm -hmm. referring to with the, carn the carnitine. For people who don't understand, that's actually allowing for fatty acid transport, correct? Exactly. It's like little trucks just bringing these fatty acids. And Wade, you want to talk about L-carnitine? Wade actually studied L-carnitine back in that university. Yeah, I actually wrote a paper on the carnitine shuttle and the relation between acetylcholenzyme A that gets released and would prevent, you know, that's where medium chain triglycerides became popular because you didn't require L-carnitine to deliver that into the, uh, into the muscle tissue. And of course, we all know where that went eventually <clears throat> in the nutrition world become quite popular now it was revolutionary you know when i was back in university in you know the early 1990s and so uh <clears throat> definite i think l-carnitine is a significant benefit in helping us metabolize fats and i do believe that's also so we're looking at multiple stages first you break down the fats in the digestion then you deliver the fats to the mitochondria and then finally you boost mitochondrial functioning or energy production uh, on those fats and so that's – and Matt, we'll get into that piece of the puzzle. And for me, who is not on any kind of ketogenic diet, I mean it's it's definitive that it absolutely works. So that's what's really yeah. cool. Yeah, I want to be clear too. You can use – you don't need to be on keto to use Capex. You can use Capex. A lot of people – and the feedback so far has been incredible – um, we released it uh, a few weeks ago and we're, we're starting to get the, the feedback and everybody just loves it because you can use Capex even on carbs because um, Wade sometimes is, is using carbs. You use it in an empty stomach first thing in the morning. That That's more for the energy benefits. So let's get into the third piece, which is this I, is I, where I will the say one other one other there. anecdotal piece, one other anecdotal piece, which is interesting. And I, I don't know exactly what it is, but it might be from the lipase and pre previous damage. I actually started to crave uh, fats, which mm. I can't ever recall that ever happening. You know, mostly fats. I'm not that big of a fatty food type of person. And all of a sudden, it's like my body was like, hey, I, I, I want more fats. And I started drinking like – like literally yeah. dumping piles of essential fatty acids on my salads. You know, some 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 of that makes me wonder whether or not that might be like you know mild hypoglycemia triggering appetite as well because you know carnitine has been shown to significantly reduce blood sugar levels. And then I know you guys also have a component in there called uh, InnoSlim, which I've mm -hmm. I've I've looked into that quite a bit and. You know, it inhibits cholesterol and fat and triglyceride synthesis and may have an effect on blood sugar as well. So it could be possible that, you know, you're, you're simply experiencing a, a spark in appetite or even a, a craving for specific fatty acids because you're, you're, you simply have a higher throughput. You're burning more with lower blood sugar levels. Yeah, that's why I, we just did a, draw, a blood draw the other day to start m testing some of these things that's been happening for me. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Because I, I don't have the science to back up the anecdotal evidence. Yeah, yeah it would be interesting. Now and, and again, me, me taking five capsules a morning for the past two months, you know, I just went in for this blood draw this morning, and I'm actually kind of curious to see what my triglycerides, fatty acids, you know, my, uh, my hemoglobin A1C, et cetera, looks like just to see how this has affected my own metabolic parameters. Well, let's get into the magic. Okay, so again, so far we've got the fatty acids, we've the L-carnitine, shuttle them into the mitochondria, and this is where the InnoSlim, the CoQ10, and the 7-Keto DHEA do their magic, especially in the liver. So let's talk about InnoSlim. So InnoSlim will do several things. One, it'll boost the AMPK in the muscle by 52% and in fat cells by 300%. Ups the ATP in your liver by up to 22%. So that's part of the energy boost. Amps your adiponectin by up to 248%. That's a key fat-burning hormone. It can elevate your GLUT4, which is a glucose shuttling molecule, by up to 488%. So that's the InnoSlim. But what it's doing is increasing the mitochondrial 
activity, especially in the liver. Same thing with 7-keto DHEA. That is activating three different enzymes in the liver, which is cranking up the mitochondrial uh, production, again, especially in the liver. And then we got CoQ10, which also has all kinds of mitochondrial benefits. So the three together are, are just cranking the, the mitochondrial production. The three being this Inno Slim and what else? The CoQ10. CoQ10. Right, you, what, ubiquinone. And then the 7 keto DHEA, which is completely different than DHA. That's actually something that, that I want to hear you talk about because DHEA is, is it, it's a banned substance. I had a fellow competitor in Spartan who actually got banned from a race because he thought he was taking DHA and he was taking DHEA and just I think he was buying it like Walgreens or CVS or something like that. So what's the difference between DHEA and 7 keto DHEA? So 7 keto DHEA um, is is very different. Okay, so DHEA is more of a, a hormone precursor which obviously uh, for anti-aging benefits is, is great. But the 7-keto DHEA is, is more of a fat loss benefit. And what the weight is doing, it actually raises your metabolism by around 5% according to some of the research we've, we've looked at. And it's doing that by increasing three different enzymes in, in the liver. So in some of the studies um, – yeah, people, it was about a 5% difference. And where people really saw the difference was when they were dieting the 7-keto DHEA group, their metabolism stayed elevated versus uh, the, the other group. So it was actually a 5.8% difference to be, to be accurate. So it's more of a fat-burning thing. I do think it is banned, by the way, by a lot of uh, competitive athletic groups, depending if it's water or whatever. So, so make sure you look into that because – uh, I know, for example, um, one fighter uh, in the UFC got got busted for seven keto DHEA. So it is, um, and what it, the way it works is specifically cell metabolism and by the brain, and it it activates PPAR alpha, which is a protein that helps make parasoxomes, burn fat, and boost weight loss. So that's the mechanism of action. And again, there's three different enzymes in the liver that it's that it's boosting. But the way we're using it is really to again activate the mitochondria in the liver. And again, we're, we're stacking that with the ubiquinone and the InnoSlim to just create the synergy. So we're getting way more fatty acids broken down. We're transporting it into the mitochondria and then we're just revving the mitochondria up. It's like we're taking the mitochondria from a V4 to a V12. So that's that's the process. So we're just way more fuel, upgrading the, the motor's horsepower, and the pistons, and then we, we got magic. So, you know, I took it, when I got the first samples, I took it, I think it was 2.50 p.m. Uh, Wade was here, and it completely wrecked my sleep. Not, not, not the quality of my sleep, it just took me a lot longer to fall asleep. It took me about three hours, repeated the experiment again. I'm like, you know, could have been just the fluke, could have been something else. Took it again at 3 p.m., and my aura ring said it took two hours and 50 minutes to fall asleep that night. Usually it takes me 15 minutes, right, uh, mm -hmm. latency to fall mm -hmm. asleep. So I know it works. Um, so that's so if you're taking it for energy, you want to take it first thing in the morning, right? Like you wake up, you take your you – know, depending on your body weight, I'd say three to six caps. You, but, about, but you're taking like it on an empty stomach, not with fats, Correct. if you're taking it in the morning like that? Correct. Now, if you if you want to use it for digestion, you use one to two caps um, with the food. So for energy, it's empty stomach first thing in. Um, again, three to six caps, and that that is the the energy protocol. And if you want to use it more for digestive purposes, then you you're going to use one to two caps. Okay. With the meals, would this replace another digestive enzyme complex? Because I mean, like you guys, for example, you have that one that. Uh, I interviewed you about the, the mass enzymes. Uh, this is like a fat digesting, fat burning type of supplement. But do you have any type of protein digesting compounds in here? If someone wanted to use this as their as their sole digestive enzyme, or do they need to stack this with something that, that digests proteins? No, we do. Uh, we wanted this for good for people on keto or even paleo to be a complete thing. Uh, so you no, know, we do have the same triphase protease blend that's in Masszymes, just at a lower dose. So it's not the same dosage as uh, Masszymes, but it's still a high dose. 
still a very high dose. Okay. So you're All still right. getting you're still getting the proteo the proteolytic enzymes, um, but again, there's no amylase. So so if you're eating carbs. There, there's no digestive aids for the carbs. So again, like Masszymes has 17 different enzymes, which for somebody yeah. eating a, a more carbs or paleo or whatever. Yeah, understood. But the, but this would this is this is primarily a supplement for people on a ketogenic diet anyway. So the assumption is they really wouldn't be having a lot of carbohydrates. Correct. Or you want to you you want to get another source of stimulants without affecting your nervous system, which is awesome, right? Because, you know, Wade, Wade's burnt out on caffeine. I've burnt out on caffeine. Like a lot of people, you know, reach adrenal uh, fatigue, which is not fun. And um, yeah, so so this is a basically a stimulant-free option for energy. Yeah. yeah. If you want to stimulate your nervous system, just take Vivance or Adderall instead, right, Matt? <laughs> that is another alternative. <laughs> I'm just having that is another alternative. Uh, okay. So, so basically you take one to two of these with any meal that you're eating during mm-hmm. the day, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet, but you kind of start things off if you want a whole bunch of energy by taking about four to five in the morning on an empty stomach. Yeah. And, and on your next race, uh, I'd like to see you take like six or seven that day, uh, again, early, um, and, and report back to me on the effects. Cause I think, hmm. I think it's going to take your performance to another level. I, really I have do. a triathlon this weekend. I could try it. I mean, that's a, that's the tricky part about racing though, is it's, it's, it's so hard to, to have comparisons when you're racing, unless you've done that identical race a year prior without the actual supplement. Like it's so hard for me when I'm racing to try things out aside from just subjective analysis of how I feel. But yeah, I mean, I'll try it out. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? I shit my speedo. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would split the dosage. I would. I would. <clears throat> so I've done experiments, and I find it works better if you do like four and four, or five and three, or six and two, something like that. <clears throat> so I take some, you know, early in the morning, and then I'll take another boost in the afternoon. That'll keep me going till midnight. Okay. And I'm taking it only for the I'm only taking it for the energy performance aspects in the in the fat digestion. What if you don't have any of the nutrigenomic issues related to impaired fat digestion? Do you need something like this? You're still going to get the energy boost. So again, I, I I mean people are just loving it for the energy. I mean, you know, coffee which you sell. And you, by the way, great coffee. I'm, I'm a big fan of Keon coffee. Um, I mean, people drink coffee for energy. So this is another uh, alternative. And you can stack it with stimulants. You can stack it with coffee. It'll just take it to another level. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, cool. So so basically, the, the name of this stuff is Capex. Why do you call it Capex? Well, I want, to me, this is the apex, uh, you know, which, is, which means the ultimate of keto genesis. Yeah. So it's a ketogenesis enhancer. So keto, apex, keto, Capex. Ketogenic apex. Okay, I get it. Very clever. All right. Well, what we're going to do is for anybody who wants to try this stuff off, uh, the website is Kenergize, like K-Energize, Kenergize. But if you go to Kenergize.com slash Greenfield, that'll just get you 20% off of any of the KPEX stuff. Uh, the coupon code is Greenfield KX. So you go to Kenergize.com slash Greenfield. Use coupon code Greenfield KX if you want to try this stuff. And then also, uh, I'll just link to all the research and everything that we talked about in the show notes and my other podcast with Wade and Matt about digesting gluten, digesting protein, some of the other enzyme complexes we talk about. Because that's kind of like what they specialize in at Bioptimizers, really. I mean, not to put words in your guys' mm-hmm. mouth, but it's basically like a yeah. you know most of your supplements are for being able to, to digest things far more efficiently. So um, Exactly. So, so I'll put a link to all that if you just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash upgrade keto. bengreenfieldfitness.com slash upgrade keto. And of course, because we started this podcast off with uh, such an interesting mix of, of different things that you guys are up to, uh, anything that is notable or interesting on the docket for later on today after we finish recording, crazy workouts, biohacks, more, more, uh, more, uh, I don't know, Ritalin or something like that, Matt. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm excited to start a cycle of injectable SARMs uh, mm. really soon. So uh, some injectable LGD4033. Um, pretty excited about SARMs and peptides. I've, I've spent a, a lot of time uh, every day really for the last two, three months. 
so yeah, I'm going to start playing with that. Uh, I think inject, I think SARMs are really exciting and uh, I think the injectable stuff is going to be the way to go. So yeah, LG, I, I'm going to do some 43 is, is pretty interesting by the way. Some people might not know what that is, but it, but it's, it, it acts very similar to an anabolic steroid to simulate muscle growth, but it doesn't actually act on your androgen receptors. So it probably doesn't down regulate your own production. Uh, it, it is, it, uh, it, it does though. I, I know a lot of, I've seen a lot of, post and and sorry i've seen a lot of uh, post sarm blood work mm -hmm. and it does drop it a little bit and not not like testosterone would but it does drop it a little bit depending yeah, on how I, much I you're have, using how long you're using i have my own theories uh, about that and i think it's because of the potential for liver toxicity depending on how you cycle it and how much you take and because the the liver is so crucial for proper endocrine dysfunction and metabolizing things like testosterone and estrogens, I suspect part of it might be due to impaired liver function with improper use. Well, that's why I think the injectables are the way to go yeah. um, versus the, the orals. So. Yeah. yeah, I'd be curious yeah, to see what, the liver. see what kind of results well, you but get. Well, but it is work. Yeah, I'm going to do the blood work, so I can report back to you. But yeah, we're uh, we're going to do the blood work, do um, a cycle of LGD 4033 for about eight weeks, and then do the blood work again. My biggest concern is more on the cholesterol. Um, people that do SARMs tend to see some some changes in there, depending on again what they're using and what their genetics are. Um, as far as down regulating, S23 is probably the worst. Mm -hmm. tends to really shut shut things down as far as testosterone production but people that do get shut down uh, typically bounce back quite quite quickly especially if they do a pct cycle yeah yeah interesting and from what i understand for for using sarms i i haven't seen a lot about it actually increasing particularly atherosclerotic components of the lipid panel like particle count for example Versus just a general increase in LDL, which may not be atherosclerotic in and of itself. So, you know, it could just be a, a, a transport mechanism response or something like that. I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't know if the lipid panel issues are that big of a deal, honestly, on us arms, but, but I, I haven't done a ton of research on LGD, particularly for that. So I'm not quite sure. How about you, Wade? Anything interesting going on this afternoon? Yeah, we're going to do a King Kong cocktail uh, IV. I know you're a big fan of IDs, and I, I love them. So uh, I got a, a naturopathic doctor who makes house visits. Uh, his name's Dr. Maxwell. So he actually comes to your house, and while you're working, he just hooks you up with the bag. And uh, so I'm going to get it. I'm going to get zapped with a, a host of uh, host of minerals and NADH and some amino acids and uh, some some B complex vitamins and you know just uh, I'll I'll be flying late into the night uh, I'll put my cape on and launch off the balcony here probably around midnight. <laughs> wow, they'll, they'll put uh, they'll put NAD in that as well, huh? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been doing less and less of the IVs for NAD and more of these patches that I get from that clinic in San Diego. Because I can right get, uh, they actually just introduced a new patch. I think it's 750 milligrams. Before that, it was about 400 milligrams. But the patches, uh, that's the only thing I've found, aside from an IV, that actually make you feel the same way as you do from an NAD IV. Because a lot of these supplements like NAD and NR and NMN that you take orally, they give you a little bit, but they don't even hold a candle to the increase in energy and the ability to be able to go by and less sleep, et cetera, that you get after a series of NAD IVs. But I, I feel very similar to what I get from the NAD on a patch with obviously a little less, you know, less, less hassle. You know, I just put it on before bed. It does a slow bleed the whole night while I'm asleep. Wow. That's cool. I, 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 I'm gonna, <laughs> I don't know. Of course I want to go try that. Yeah. You should look into the patches. So it's, it's a little bit more comfortable too. It doesn't feel like somebody's kicking you in the gut. <laughs> by the way we were uh, we were screaming your name the last time we did a week of neurofeedback because uh, uh, you, you know we were trying to uh break your record on, on time on uh doing a full iv of a full bag and uh, i got down to 30 minutes the last day and then, then you crushed my spirits when you told me that you were down to 10 minutes so thanks thanks ben that's not uh, a bag, but no, no. that's that's a push iv so it's only yeah, 30 ml yeah. of fluid but 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's not fun. And I actually do it myself because I don't trust anybody else to be pushing it in. So I just do a milliliter stop, one round of box breathing, another milliliter stop, one round of box breathing. I can get it in about 10 minutes, but it sucks. And I always have a garbage pan, can uh, next to me to puke in should I need to. Um, but, but I, I honestly think the sympathetic nervous system response that you get from that is part of the reason you feel so damn good afterwards. Same reason you feel really good after just like a a soul crushing workout, for example. So I think that's a Mm -hmm. little part of it too. Yeah. We we were, we were screaming your name. That's funny. That's funny. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad two grown men somewhere are screaming my name. And, uh, (laughs) in the meantime, if, if you guys want to check out what Matt and Wade are up to again, go to kenergize.com slash greenfield. Well, the K kenergize.com slash greenfield. You get 20% off of any of this capex that we talked about. If you use coupon code greenfield KX, then the show notes are over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash upgrade keto, Matt, Wade, Thanks for coming on the show, guys. Well, thanks for listening to today's show. You can grab all the show notes, the resources, pretty much everything that I mentioned over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, along with plenty of other goodies from me, including the highly helpful Ben Recommends page, which is a list of pretty much everything that I've ever recommended for hormones, sleep, digestion, fat loss, performance, and plenty more. Please also know that all the links, all the promo codes that I mentioned during this and every episode help to make this podcast happen and to generate income that enables me to keep bringing you this content every single week. So when you listen in, be sure to use the links in the show notes, use the promo codes that I generate because that helps to float this thing and keep it coming to you each and every week.